And so we had a very nice time visiting with them, stayed up late, talking, visiting with them. And then the next morning we actually got up early and went to, uh, I think we went to Starbucks for breakfast and um, had breakfast with them and then uh, headed on. But it was a very, very pleasant for uh, both of us, as far as I know. In fact, um, in May, we went, we were up in Michigan again on vacation and, and met with the same classmate and had a supper together and got to see them again. So. so those are positive experiences, right? Very, very pleasant, positive experiences. And does anyone, can anyone remember perhaps a, somewhat of a negative experience? <laughs> I know that Connie and I are going tomorrow with my, we're going to pick up my brother. Actually, my brother's coming and staying here overnight tonight. And we're, we're driving to uh, about a two, uh, three, three and a half hour ride to, um, not what's the name of that town? Fort Myers. Fort Myers. And uh, <laughs> we're going to be staying overnight tomorrow night with my sister's son, my youngest sister's son. She passed away quite a few years ago. Her son lives in Fort Myers with his family. We haven't seen them in probably 25, 30 years or so. We felt mm -hmm. we ought to go by and see them. So uh, we don't, we were, we're praying for a very positive experience. <laughs> So that's that's something that we're looking forward to as well. We I think we think it will be. I think back to a, another experience which I had on another vacation. This was staying with some, um, well, they were I guess friends of friends, up in near near Toronto in Canada, and um, they were um, they're Indian, Pakistani. And we spent the night in their home. And it wasn't really the bad experience, except they have a shop and they close it at 9 p.m. And so we were eating this big supper about 11 something at night. And then after supper, we visited. And then about 1 a.m., they wanted to take us and show us one of the other family members home. And I'm like, I'm ready to go to bed. But <laughs> I think we finally got to bed about 2 a.m. or something. And then... Ooh got up the next morning and were able to head on but uh the hours they keep <laughs> were not according to our time clock <laughs> <laughs> well i think of an, a negative experience with having a house guest i won't say names and i won't say what church it wasn't this church but we had a the health lecturer for the weekend coming to stay with us he was doing a, a very you know good health lecture uh, weekend and he when he got there I had made a nice vegan um, lentil soup and um, he saw me warming it up in the microwave and he said I don't need anything that's been warmed up in a microwave so I thought okay what am I going to do next <laughs> then he said he went like this on his hand and he looked at the watch and he said and I have to eat be before three hours before going to bed I don't eat you know later than that and I thought, oh boy, this is, and then he wanted me to, um, on Sunday, go buy him some goji berries from some health food store. And mm -hmm. I just, it was very demanding and very, I don't know, <laughs> the Lord tried, I mean, not the Lord, had to give me patience, but this gentleman, I never had such an experience. I'm only giving you the tip of the iceberg. So that was a very <laughs> negative experience of having somebody. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Here's a quarter. Go find you some. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was at the church on Sabbath evening, he had a vespers. I'm talking with people and he comes over to me and he says, I got to get home and have something to eat and get to bed early. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I thought, <laughs> I won't be having this gentleman again. <laughs> Talk about majoring in minors. Hey. Yeah. This, this is a number of years ago while I was in England. Um, I decided that I was going to hitchhike somewhat ar around Scandinavia. And uh, on my way, uh, I was doing a lot of walking. And uh, having walked for a long time that afternoon, I decided I'd need to find a place. 
the houses were remote. So when I came to a, a house uh, that uh, seemed as though they might be accommodating, this was in, um, I think it was Denmark, mm. and uh, knocked on the door and uh, and a lady came to the door and she, she, you know, we communicated. And I said, I'm just looking for a place to just lay my head for the night because I'm so tired. I'm hitchhiking. And uh, I could see that she was a little reserved and, and um, concerned. And so she said, well, I, I have a place at the back of the house you can stay in. And so that's where I stayed with my, some straw. And, uh, but I did sleep, I was so tired. <laughs> I think in the morning, if I'm not mistaken, I think in the morning she did, she did prepare me some breakfast. Oh, nice kind of her. Uh, on the same trip, when I got to Germany, uh, I was looking for an Adventist connection there and I found one in the, in the telephone directory when we used to use those and uh, I, I, <laughs> I saw Adventists. I said, oh, wonderful, praise the Lord. I made my way, it was getting dark, I knocked on the door and um, someone came to the door. I said, oh, wonderful. And he said, yes. I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just traveling around uh, Germany here. I'm, I think I said, uh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist as well. He said, oh, oh, okay, we're Reformed Adventists. Uh -oh. So that was my first encounter with a Reformed Adventist. But they, he welcomed me in, he said, come on in, and uh, gave me a place to stay for the night. And uh, um, this, was, this was quite uh, momentous as far as I was concerned. Mm. Uh, welcomed <laughs> by strange brothers, if mm -hmm. that's not in terms. Well, we are grateful for those experiences. Uh, even, the, even the negative experiences uh, are, can teach us something, you know. Uh, let's look at our passage for this evening from the book of Acts chapter nine, and we're gonna start with verse 20, and we're going to do it to the end of the chapter, verse 42. So uh, I will just kind of tell the story as, as we know we have been doing. Either you should tell us a story and then we will read the story through and then we'll ask some questions. Um, remember beginning there with verse 20 of Acts 9, uh, Saul is in Damascus, we, we, we remember that. And, uh, and of course he's also, and from Damascus he goes on to Jerusalem. But while he's in Damascus, you remember the story, uh, he began to preach immediately after his experience with the Lord. He got back on his feet. We know Ananias, we remember that, but he, uh, he uh, started preaching that day and he was preaching all through Damascus. And then the people began to say to themselves, isn't this the same guy that really was raising all kinds of havoc, all kinds of trouble for the church and, and rounding up Christians and taking them back to the priests and so forth and so on. And uh, they say, yeah, this is the same guy. But the, the interesting thing is that Paul became more and more popular and more and more, he became, uh, did a great job in terms of evangelism. Um, and, and the Jews were baffled and by, by he was doing, he was proving that Jesus was the Messiah. And they became, they said, this fellow really has something to do, to do with, with the, the coming kingdom. Uh, but again, they started to, talked to each other and they said they decided they want to kill this guy because he's not doing he's not really preaching the things that we think that he ought to be preaching so he came to read jerusalem uh he left damascus he went to jerusalem you remember how he left damascus he was uh because he was being threatened they put him inside of a basket and they they let him down uh through somebody's window down to the bottom you remember that story he went to he goes on to jerusalem and in Jerusalem, uh, the, uh, the, the disciples, I noticed something interesting. They, they have three words for the disciples of Jesus. They call them either followers, 
uh, disciples or apostles. And I think we, we understand the difference between those three types of followers. But uh, he goes on to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, uh, the people became afraid of him. The, the, the followers, the disciples, uh, very much afraid of him because of who he was. His reputation followed him. And, uh, but there was one person who did not take issue with him. And that gentleman was named as Barnabas. Remember the story of Barnabas? Mm -hmm. uh, Barnabas uh, took him and brought him to the apostles, it says. And, uh, and, the, and, and the apostles, of course, welcomed him. And, and, that, and they, Barnabas reminded them that the Lord had used this man in a very special way and that he had uh, done great things for the Lord and he was doing great things for the church. And it says that the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria, enjoyed a time of peace. They were very happy that they got, written, that got rid of the guy who was creating so much trouble for the church. And now they had a time of peace. And now beginning with verse 32, Peter comes into the, into the, into the scene here. Peter is traveling the, about the country. And he goes to the saints, it says here, in Lydia, in Lydda, actually, L-Y-D-D-A. Does anybody know how to really pronounce that? Is it Lydda or Lydda? Lydda. Um, Lydia. What is it? I'm Lydia. not the one to talk, talk about pronunciation, but I've always heard it, Lydia. No, no that's oh, a person no, I name. Oh, okay. Lydda. Lydda? Lydda. I don't remember I Lydda. Lydda. I only remember Lydia. <laughs> and... See, I told there you I wasn't the one. Yes, I'm sorry. There he finds a fellow, a paralytic, and give me his name. How do you pronounce his name? Aeneas. Aeneas. Okay. He, there he finds Aeneas, who's been a paralytic for eight years. And it's interesting that Peter speaks to him. He doesn't pray for him. He just speaks to him, and he calls him by name. He says... He just says to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, take up your mat, and walk. Can you imagine that? So he, he Peter has, Peter's a changed person now, isn't he? Completely changed. He has the, well, we would call it the audacity, but he doesn't even pray for the guy. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ heals you, and the man stands and is healed immediately. Then Peter goes on to Joppa, and there a disciple named Tabitha, which means Dorcas. We know the story of Dorcas. And, and she was, you know, the, she had a great reputation for helping the poor, helping people, especially uh, uh, women. She would you know, uh, sew things and make things for them. Unfortunately, she got very sick and she died. And then when she died, they took, they washed her body. They took her upstairs into someone's home, laid her on a bed, and uh, they were, of course, weeping over her and so forth. And someone remembered that Peter happened to be in town. And so they sent two individuals to Joppa to bring Peter uh, to the house immediately. And so they go and they find Peter. And Lydia was, uh, uh, when they found Peter, excuse me, when they found Peter, Peter comes right back into to Joppa and he Peter goes into the house, goes upstairs to where the woman was laying down. And when he finds out that she is actually dead, in this case, he kneels down and he prays for her. He does something for her, which he did not do for the other gentleman. He prays for Lydia, for, Lydia, for, uh, for Dorcas, and uh, Dorcas comes to life. Um, Peter went with them. And the widows stood around the crying, and, or the widows, I should say, stood around the beds and crying and saying, thank God, thank God, because she has been brought back to life. Um, anyways, that's basically the story. And many people believed in the Lord, and many people joined the church as a result. Okay, now let's take some time and read what we just got through talking about so we can get a little bit more picture. Pastor James, we have, there we go. Okay, um, we can begin there with verse 20. Uh, and if each person if, would read two verses to begin with, can we have someone read verse 20 and 21? 
And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is indeed the son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them and change the priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. They were watching for him day and night in the city gates so they could murder him, but Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with the, with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. Church that had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. Meanwhile, Peter traveled from place to place, and he came down to visit the believers in the town of Lydia. There he met a man named Ananias. An Ananias. He had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your sleeping mat. And he was healed instantly. Then the whole population of Lydia and Sharon saw Yes, look around and they turn to the Lord. There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. About this time, she became ill and died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda, so they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. So Peter returned with them, and as soon as he arrived, he took them to the upstairs room. The room was filled with widows who were weeping and showing him the coats and the other clothes that Dorcas had made for them. <laughs> Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the believers, and he presented her to them alive. The news spread through the whole town, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. Hmm. Oh, well, that, that's quite a quite a story, isn't it? <laughs> quite a story. Well, let's 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 uh, go over some of these questions that, uh, for discussion. Uh, the first question they have here for us is: When did you get your first Bible study? your first Bible study. Who, who gave you the Bible study and what did you learn from that Bible study? Anybody? I don't know if you would call it a Bible study. I guess, yeah, it's a Bible study. When I was um, 
I think I was in sixth grade and um, I was going to Sunday school. I went to a congregational church and I remember our teacher, Mr. Distenfeld, was teaching us about um, the apostles. Like we, we learned the names of the apostles. Hmm. Did you, what did you say you learned? We were learning the like the or the disciples. We were learning the, the you know the twelve disciples. We were learning their names and a little bit about them. Sure. We were studying you know about about yeah. the ministry of Jesus. Okay, very good. Well, you know, I remember the first Bible study that was given to me. It was way back when. Uh, some of you may remember the name Jim Gilly. Uh, mm -hmm. Jim Gilly was. Uh, just before he retired, I think he was the president of uh, one of our media outlets. What was it? Free ABN. Okay. Well, Jim Gilly was an associate pastor at the Village Church in South Lancaster. And that's where I first started going to church as a, a young teenager. And um, he took a real interest in me, gave me some Bible studies. And I remember... That's a long time ago, but I still remember the things that I took away from there was that Lou, he said to me, there's no place where you cannot pray. There's no time where you don't meet where you cannot pray. You can pray to the Lord anytime, at any place, and he will hear you. And uh, he made that real impression on me. So he studied with me prayer, the whole concept of prayer, and also, of course, from the Bible, how to study the Bible. So that's, uh, I still remember that. No matter where you are, no matter what uh, time it may be, there's no place where you cannot pray and the Lord will cannot hear you. Hmm. Anyone else? I don't actually recall offhand ever being given a Bible study. I've, I've given Bible studies, but I don't recall being given one other than recently attending this um, non-denominational men's Bible study on Friday mornings. Anyone else? You know, when you grow up in an Adventist home, you have worship yeah. from being a, a, a just a child. But the first formal lessons would have to be in Sabbath school. Yeah. With the little That's, friend. Yeah. And, um, and then in church school. And I am so thankful for the opportunity that I've had of going through our schools and through our Sabbath schools to uh, learn. And they teach incrementally, you know, we go over the same lessons maybe year after year, but they add a little more to a little more detail to it so that we can um, flesh out the whole story. And it's, um, it's been a, a, such a blessing to have wow. that just part of your DNA. Mm, I was, I was thinking that too, because there was, it's like, we well, I mean, I can think of the formal baptismal study, and I think that's kind of what we gravitate to a little bit. But in reality, yeah, my little friend and my parents reading it to me throughout the week. Mm. I mean, that's that's a Bible study, and I, yeah. we shouldn't we shouldn't minimize that. That's really true. You know, it's so true. Those uh, teachers in junior division greater role and all the rest of those divisions they made making impressions on the lives of these little children and I still remember my junior uh, teacher my uh, in junior age kids I remember that it was Mr. Alfke and John Alfke and um, he made a great impression he was a pilot during the second world war and he would tell us stories about his uh, experiences and he was uh, a, a very devout Christian and so he would have us over to his home as a class sometimes for a meal and so forth and so on. So he was a very, very, he made a lot of impressions on me. Like you said, uh, Pastor, he, uh, we can never, we, we need to celebrate these people that take so much time every week to teach our children, you know, from the scriptures. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Anyone else? I remember Miss Warren. Uh, she was a Bible worker in the Evangelistic Centre in the middle of London. And I used to go to that 
strict congregation wor worship on Sabbaths. Oh. Very large church. But somehow she focused on three or four of us uh, who were 13, 14 year olds. And she approached us and uh, asked us if we'd like to join, uh, have Bible studies in preparation for baptism. So although I might have been going to the church for some, I don't know how long, but at some point she felt that these young men needed to be prepared uh, to, to have a relationship with the Lord. So mm. I, I remember Miss Warren, that's a long time ago and I was maybe 13 or 14. Wow. Well, here's another question for us. Do you know someone whose life was changed radically after they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, do you know someone whose life was changed radically after they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior? Outside of ourselves? Yeah, that's a good point. Outside of ourselves. <laughs> that's exactly right. Outside, that's a good, because that's, we've all have had radical changes in our lives as a result of accepting Jesus. Mm. No, I remember a gentleman when I was, I was working in Massachusetts, I, I, this small church, about 70, 75 people, and um, this young man came to church, and I got to know him because he was very, very uh, a great student of the Bible, very outspoken fellow. He, he wasn't quiet at all, quiet, and so got to know him real well, and come to find out that he was, uh, he was a real troublemaker in that town in Massachusetts. He used to drive his car down Main Street of Massachusetts at 75 miles an hour. And he used to say Main Street, he would, cops would pull him over. He had spent all kinds of times in, in prison and so forth and so on. Um, but he became a Christian. And I tell you, he told us his story on how he became a Christian. It's just absolutely incredible how the Lord would. He used to spend his Friday nights in the bar rooms, you know, with his friends. And he used to love to weight lift and so forth. But after he became an Adventist Christian, was baptized and so forth, he, he was so different. And he decided to take that same energy to witness for the Lord. So he would go back to bar rooms, even though some of our members did not appreciate that. He would go into bar rooms, talk to his old friends, bring them to church on Sabbath morning. I still remember one fellow he brought to church. He was called the Hulk. Remember that that. Uh, cartoon the hulk was it the hulk the green monster guy anyways he uh, he told us that um, uh, this guy came to church one time with a big tattoo on his on his arm of the hulk and uh, he came in a t-shirt it was all torn up he had been in a fight the night before and this friend of his who happened to be this new church member at, at our church went in there brought him out of the bar room brought him to church that sabbath morning and that fellow was baptized and became a great member of the church. He became a great deacon and so forth and so on. So that is a story that I will never forget because that gentleman became a 100% a, a for, for the Lord when he used to be just the opposite. So praise God for the work of the Holy Spirit. Any others, any other thoughts, any other stories? Well, Ray, who attends our church and uh, comes to Scott Sabbath School class, mm -hmm. I've talked to him and he said that um, when he became a Christian, his life radically changed. I don't know all the details, but he said it was a huge change. Of course, by the time he came and um, started coming to Apopka, he had been a Christian for a while, but he said he went through a radical change. Yes, I, 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 he has shared that with me as well. That okay. You're absolutely right. He has made a radical, radical change in his life. He's quite a drummer, you know. He used to be, a, as you know, Kevin, he was a, a drummer in nightclubs right mm -hmm. yes. and, uh, and a very good drummer by the way and uh, he gave me a little demonstration one time when I went over to his house he took me into his room where he has all these drums and he mm. sat there and he played the drums for me for a while man I tell you uh, uh, he was real fast but I uh, I was going deaf so I left <laughs> very good very good okay any others any other any others with a, a story to share you know, it's a sad, sad commentary, and I don't know if it's the fault of my perception or if it's, it's a fact, 
I can think of more people who started out as good church members who have slipped back into the world than I than the other way around. Yeah. And um, that's a sad thing. Looking back on my on my school, for instance, my school friends, I can think of more of them who have gone the other way than than who have uh, come to the Lord, and that's that is so sad. Yeah. Mm. I can share yes. one thing, uh, Lou. Yeah. Um, our school that we had in uh, Santa Cruz Junior Academy, uh, we had uh, a group who were inspired to, they were challenged by some teachers and they were inspired to hold a student-led revelation seminar in our church in Watsonville, which is right there at Santa Cruz. And there were some in the group who were 100%. And there were some of the group not quite so sure that they wanted to get involved, but they decided they would come. I think it did more for those kids than it did for anybody else that came to the Revelation Seminar and they were changed. Mm -hmm. they were definitely mm -hmm. changed and I saw a real change in some of them that had been you know just sort of on the edges and now boy they're right in there oh, sir, I think we, there, I'm sorry go ahead there's yeah. something else that I I'm uh, I know of who made a change I don't know his story personally but I've heard him tell it and that's Charles Hogabrooks uh -huh. mm -hmm. Christian, Christian singer now, but he started out as singing in nightclubs and that type of a life. Yes, he's got um, quite the voice. Go ahead, Brother Kennedy. I, I just wanted to share with you in view of the fact that tomorrow uh, the service takes place of us at Lawrence. And if you've ever visited with him and uh, recounted how he was a, a, a real, uh, he was out there mm. and, um, and he'll tell you up to this last year when I spoke with him, he remembers how the, the Lord was gracious to him because he was such a smoker for, I don't know, 20 or 40 years, I can't remember that. And so therefore he developed cancer. And, uh, and lung problems. So it says he has no complaints whatsoever because God is good to him. He should have died many times in car crashes and health wise and things like those. But uh, here he was celebrating his 90th year of life. Amen. And to him, that was just a demonstration of God's grace. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Now let me ask. Let me ask this: Have you ever tried to join a group or a club and you were rejected? Have you ever tried to join a group, a club, or any other group, any other kind of group, and you were rejected? Hmm. I uh, I remember going to when I first applied to an academy after I had dropped out of school for several years. They told me I needed to go back to school. So I went back to school. The first school that I applied at was Garden State Academy in New Jersey. And I can still remember, I brought my aunt with me and I had a, an old car that I had bought and we drove all the way to New Jersey from Massachusetts. And mm -hmm. I still remember going into the principal's office and he had one, two other individuals there with him. And they asked me a bunch of questions and they showed me around the school and so forth. But at the very end, they said, we are sorry, but we will not be able to accept you to our school. And because number one, you are older than the other students. I dropped out of school when I was 16. And at this point I was uh, almost uh, 20. And this is you're older than all the other children in this young people in the school. You have had some bad habits in the past of smoking and you've had some drinking and so forth. So we can't, we don't want to take the chance. That's in essence what they said. Needless to say, I was devastated. My aunt who was with me was also very devastated. And I went back and told Jim Gilly about it. And he was so angry that he said he was gonna write a letter to that principal. And then he started looking around again for me and he finally got me into Union Springs Academy. 
but I was very, very hurt by that other situation. Um, anybody has had an experience like that where you either does, you know, a club of some sort or maybe even a church and you were not accepted? Hmm. I have um, recently finished 18 weeks of clinical rotations at various hospitals. And um, the hardest thing about it was um, feeling like an outsider. You come to this place and you're working with these people you don't even know. It's just like starting a new job, only you have to do it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it very difficult. And in one of the places where I went, they, like I would try to talk to then, you know, some of the people at lunch and they just like snubbed me, like they wouldn't let me, you know, in on their conversation and stuff. It was just so, so odd. It was a terrible feeling. I felt rejected. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that's hard, isn't it? That's not a very good uh, feeling. Uh, anyone else? Oh, I start to wonder when you approach a group. Uh, that's in conversation and uh, when you come within earshot, or earshot I should say, yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. the conversation stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it me or <laughs> yeah. is it the end of the conversation? Yeah. These are well, fellow believers. Yeah. Yeah, that that I think that hurts so much, isn't doesn't it? When it is a fellow believers or a church or someone you really uh, trusted or really depended on to to get you through something. This is to the here's here's the last question. From the way God sets up opportunities to witness, how does that free you from fears in evangelism and community involvement? From the way God sets up opportunities to witness, how does that free you from the fears of, of uh, fears in evangelism and community involvement? I know that's a toughie. Um, Good. Someone say something? I started to, but I'm not sure I totally followed the question, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, <laughs> let me, okay, let me, let me, uh, um, oh boy, I just lost it here, here just a second. Okay, uh, from the way God sets up uh, opportunities, opportunities to witness how does that free you from fears in evangelism and community involvement? I know the question isn't is very, very clear, but that's the question. That, uh, the, the way God, the way God sets it up frees us. And okay. Yeah. I like like he it. did for Peter and Paul. And, um, how does that take away the fear? Uh, for me, it takes it um, from being it doesn't feel forced. It feels mm. more just organic and natural. If mm. I allow the Holy Spirit to lead me to the opportunities in the natural flow of things, as opposed to uh, maybe going and searching, not that you shouldn't be paying attention and, and searching for people, but you know, I've, I've found like just when it just naturally happened, it was very, very rewarding and comfortable. Okay, I hope yeah. that's answering that question. Yes, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, no, I, I, get what, I get what you're saying. I think um, for me, it's, um, there's certain things that I wouldn't want to do above on my own, but if I have a group that's doing them, I can join the group and do them that uh that helps mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well when you have the mindset that that uh, god creates opportunities and puts presents them to you 
that things don't just happen by chance. Um, you you follow follow that up by saying, well, this must be an opportunity for me to share my faith. If uh, we're looking for opportunities to 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 share our faith, to, to share God with others, then we'll be expecting that to happen, and that. God puts that in our way. It's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I like what you say. We are expecting that to happen. So we have we need to have expectations that God will will uh, put people or situations in our pathway by which we can share Him. But we expect it, right? Like they say, when we come to church in the morning on Saturday, we ought to become expecting the Lord to speak to us in some way. And that's when it happens, when we come expecting, expectation, Lord, this is your time. <laughs> so that, I like that. So um, I'm praying that tomorrow when I go visit my, my uh, nephew, that um, I will be able to say him and his wife. And Connie and I will be able to um, share with them in some, in some way uh, the good news, which I don't think he is uh, a church for period at all. But... Um, Okay, any other thoughts? Well, may I just make one comment on um, something that impressed me, which I, I cannot wrap my heads around. And that is when we were talking about Saul in Damascus and then Saul in Jerusalem. And it said that when he was in Damascus, the, the Jews got together and they made plans to kill him. When he's in Jerusalem, uh, he was. He had to dispute with the Greek-speaking Jews, and they tried to kill him. What is with these people who are always trying to? Kill? I'm serious. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you talk about being afraid for stepping out and 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 uh, doing the Lord's work. Uh, how did they do that? And 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 when these people, wherever they went, were trying to kill them. I mean, we have people that disagree with us. But I've never, that I know of, had anybody out to try to kill me mm -hmm. like they did. How in the world do you function under that kind of pressure? Yeah. Good point. You know, that is a good, that is a good How point. are they so bloodthirsty or undisciplined or, I, I don't know, what, what, what caused that people in that generation to be that way? You didn't watch the news this evening? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. But, th th you know, it, it doesn't, it, it, stepping out for the Lord isn't without its, its, um, without its uh, dangers, I, too. I think just like today, I, you know, the devil plays on our fears really well even today. But you imagine at a time when the Savior of the world is there, that is going to be destroying Satan's work, that the church that he's established is going to be victorious what, no matter what he tries, I would think that the efforts of Satan to play on the fears of people and of the Jews probably ramp that up in such a way that has never been seen and we won't see again until the very end when time's just about up. Um, you know, I... I think of the fact that, you know, with somebody like Paul here, he went from being one of those bloodthirsty people to being the one that's sought to be killed here in a matter of weeks. Uh, just it's just the devil is so cruel at playing on people's fears and their desire for power, I guess. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of. Hmm. You know, I feel like I rambled a little bit, but <laughs> no, no, you know, I, I, as you were speaking, Pastor, I also re, re, you mentioned Paul, but look at Peter. Mm -hmm. The story of Peter tonight is a whole different story, is a whole different uh, picture of the Peter that we have known before this time. Peter before this time was uh, not the same guy. He was maybe he had, I'm sure he had lots of fears and insecurities. I'm sure he did. But tonight's story tells us a, a different Peter. He was very bold. Can you imagine going to someone who had been sick for eight years, walking into the room and saying, brother so-and-so, get up. Jesus Christ mm -hmm. has healed you. I mean, that is a different Peter. And that's what God wants to do and will do in us as well. 
the fear will be gone. He just walks in there. <laughs> he does In that case, he didn't even pray for the guy. He just says, in the Lord Jesus Christ, stand up, walk. And wow. then in another case, under the situation with Dorcas, there he does get down and pray for her, but he's a different person. And so I'm saying, Lord, you're going to make us different people too. Take away the you'll take away the fears, you'll take away all those insecurities that we have. And God has promised that we'll be able to do. In fact, uh, uh, Pastor, you have you have your Bible there, right there with you. Let's close with this. You have your Bible up there with you. I'd yeah, like yeah. us to go to John, John chapter 14. I just happened to think of this passage today when I was reading the story of John chapter 14, verse 12. Would you read that for us? And we'll end yeah. with this. John 14, verse 12. Now, remember, this is the, the, the story of, of this is Jesus, of course, was a great healer. There's no, but now have Peter and Paul and all the rest of them. But listen what this says. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. That's mind blowing, and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Wow, can you imagine that? Even greater works mm -hmm. than what uh, Jesus did, and we saw it tonight in Peter. We see it tonight in Paul, right? So, uh, yeah, God will take away the fear. So even if they kill us, we will still not. We will not in any way bend. Amen. Okay. Okay, Pastor, what, give us some instruction for next week. I think for next week, we are, uh, because I skipped ahead, we're probably to the second half of, if I'm not mistaken, and I very well could be. Um, I think actually we'll be into uh, Acts chapter 11. Um, so I believe that Freddie's going to be back, so it's going to be probably one of the two of us that I know of at least. So, um, but I think we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 11 and uh, just continuing in our study. Uh, so yeah, that's what I, the instructions I have for you right now. <laughs> so I was wondering uh, before we're done, uh, Hugo, what, what did you see on the news that uh, was similar to politics? <laughs> oh, no, I don't know what we do up from that. Oh. Just the, 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 the um, <laughs> It's just the passion that was displayed in, in I guess it was East Jerusalem, is it? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It is. There was this friction between the Palestinians and the Jews mm -hmm. living in yeah. the same city. Was okay. there somebody, um, just so I, I'm clear on this, uh, because I don't remember a couple weeks ago when Freddie had uh, gotten Lou to do it and then myself, was there another person that was going to take Acts 11? Because I didn't want to just make that assumption. I just didn't write that down, so I don't remember. I thought it was Acts 9 and 10 he was talking about, not Acts 11. Well, we did 10 last week because I got out of order. And we had done the first half of Acts 9, I think the week before that. Okay. So we got a little bit off, but we should be back to the right spot. So cool. You know, before we right. before we pray and close, uh, I just want to uh, welcome uh, Betty and, and Carol's sister joined us here a little while ago. And we're glad you joined us. Barbara, right? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, Barbara, we're glad you joined us uh, this evening. And uh, we are, we as a church have been, we prayed for you, those of you who have known, those of us who have known you, knew your husband, and you lost your husband. How long ago was that again? No, that was the other sister. That was Charlotte. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Okay. So your oh, husband is still, is, your husband is still with you, right? Yes. And he turned 91 last Sunday. 90 wow. this past Sunday? Wow, right. this past Sunday, 91. Wow, bless his heart. Well, well, thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, we, the other sister, that's the one that goes to the, uh, used to go to the hospital church, what they used to she call does. the hospital church. She, I, go to, I go to the hospital church. You go to the hospital church. Mm -hmm. she, used to, oh, she used to go to the Plymouth Sorrento church. Right. Am I correct? Yeah. She does. Okay. Well, again, um, Okay, Pastor James, would you close with prayer? Absolutely. 
Uh, Father, we thank you for the time that we've had together tonight and for your spirits leading in our discussion and for our edification. Uh, I just uh, ask that you would keep us attentive to the leading of your Holy Spirit through those times and those moments when we may have an opportunity uh, to share our love for you with somebody else. And I pray that you would keep us all close to your word and close to you in the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bye-bye, y'all. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night. Yeah.